evening. This is a meeting of the Township Committee, March 4, 2019. The notice requirements provided for in the open public meetings act have been satisfied. Notice of this meeting was properly given by transmission to the Star Ledger, the Independent, and the Two River Times, and by posting at Middletown Township Municipal Building, and filing with the Township Clerk all on January 10, 2019. Here. 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 Contamination in our recycling uh, stream. 
And in fact, if you go in about five or six pages, you'll see some photos uh, were taken um, around town in various uh, people's recycling containers. Um, some of them contain uh, large plastic bags, which are prohib which were prohibited in, re in recycling containers. You can't put recycled materials in plastic. Um, construction material, you see, in the recycling container. One has an entire lawnmower to put into the blue, blue can. Um, that was a mistake. <laughs> that wasn't staged. No, it wasn't staged. It, 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 it legit. Um, and, um, and the reason it's an issue is because the excessive contamination of materials um, that are either bulk items or trash, garbage, um, in the recycling stream, in the end, is going to start costing towns money um, because you're going to have to pay for that excess material that has to be disposed of separately. And probably the biggest impact is that if you have a pattern of, of not having good quality recyclable material, um, the next time you do um, a contract, the cost will be very high because there will be records showing that you don't recycle very well. So what we're looking to do is to start to you know, educate the public. Some communities have gone to very strict enforcement, um, uh, including penalties. And we, we don't, Want to take that approach? You know, we want to um, try to put out as much information as we can to the public about what they should and shouldn't be doing in terms of recycling. Um, and we have warning stickers that we're going to start to put on uh, people's cans. Uh, we're still going to take it. Time and say, here, here's what's wrong. Here's what shouldn't be in here. Um, but we're thinking of the target. Um, Earth Day was what was it? Oh, April twenty second. Twenty second. Second, beginning April 22nd, we, we, we will not take it. If, if, if we can't have the wrong materials in it, um, we won't take it. We'll have warned people multiple times ahead of time. Uh, we'll be able to keep track of the addresses that um, have received warnings. Uh, Ted put together some information about recycling in general. April 22nd provides 63 recycling cycles yeah. for each right. north and south side to yeah. every other yeah. Well, we'll have time to put it in the newsletter. Yeah. Ted, so, you want to talk about the, the overall recycling material uh, data that you put together? Yeah, if you look at just past this photograph, you'll see, if you want to look at your, there's an auto report done by our second uh, contractor. Uh, that shows the percentage of contamination rate in the sample. One sample, the total of one sample we look now at the site of pickups for one particular decade uh, back in the sample. Um, it lists all the types of materials, some are recyclable, and on the bottom section are all the uh, materials that were recyclable. Um, plastic bags right now happen to be the, the, the largest contaminant in the room, the city, that causes, it, causes the most problems with the single stream recycling process. Um, you know, our recycling consultant will put together some information for us, and he uh, will even eat for hours about this kind of thing. But I'm going to sum it up. If you look at that chart, that spreadsheet, the will see contamination rate in this one sample was about 16.4%. So, um, and the target is 10. The target is 10%, and that's, you know, we'd like to actually surpass that. We'd love to go into the next contract in three years as our regular next fit spec with a, a record of being at 5%. Um, contamination rate because that would ultimately save us money in our contract now. Mm -hmm. So that's that's going to come with education. It's going to come with uh, some enforcement, and, but mostly it is education. Um, so we have some, you know, there's a group called the Recycling Partnership that has some, you know, the flyers and the stickers that you put on the cans and everything else that kind of just warn people, you know, this is your recycling part. You can't put plastic bags in it. Counties. Things and then we found a lawnmower sticking out. Obviously, we're not going to take it. Please remove it and we'll come back and get it next time. So, uh, that's kind of the, the path we want to take with that in terms of doing enforcement. And as part of that, our recycling consultant, Wayne Defeo, also went through our recycling ordinance and made it conform with uh, what we're collecting now and what the markets are bearing uh, to a certain extent. So the last, the final pages here are the recycling orders that we are proposing to 
to uh, <coughs> update it. And of course, we'll give this to council to look at we'll that review. That's kind of the idea uh, where we're going to head in that, in that aspect. And Ted, just correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I, I thought I, on the, in the recycle, um, so recycle coach or recycle now? Recycle coach. Recycle yeah. coach. Okay. There's, there's a, uh, basically like an FAQ that you can type different items into and it tells you what the proper way to right, dispose exactly. of it is. Because okay. there are some items, you know, we have a list, of, in this material too, it's a list of the standard four or five items that can go on a recycling cart. But we do recycle many other items that the, the recycling mm -hmm. like paints uh, like scrap metal and uh, heavy invention plastics and things like that. You know, water oil. Obviously you can't put those in your cart. Sure. But uh, if you go to your recycle coach app, um, you can launch anything and it'll tell you where to recycle. Right. Eight, eight, ten. One comment on the on the chart with regard to recyclable and non-recyclable materials. There's a 12.2 percent uh, of the total under non-recyclable labeled residue. Can I pull that back up? It's the last one. Non-recyclable. Uh, yeah, that's you know, that's essentially garbage that's been thrown in there. Is, is anything that doesn't doesn't wind up in other non-recyclable categories? Right. Not, you know, some of those non-recyclable items are recyclable in other <coughs> markets, but um, that the whole residue would be probably food waste and you know, clothes and cloth, yeah. clothing materials and things like that. Are totally non-recyclable. That, that's a fairly high percentage. It is. It's in that. I mean, it's in that recycling yeah. camp. There's a couple of percentages that came out of this that are that are cause for concern. One of them is that we. And we're, we're definitely going to refine numbers uh, based upon the use. And, you know, one of the benefits of having the GPS chips in, in the cans is that you can gather data. We're, we're in the process of doing that. We have some rough numbers down. And it shows that in the north zone, we have about 80% uh, compliance. South zone, 85. I mean, 15 to 20% people aren't even recycling at all. So, the so of the it's it. <laughs> To be fair, and I've had this conversation with Ted and, and others, right? And so I think education is key, and this is a very big step. But we're not making it really that much easier for people either. I mean, so I understand what you're saying, and recycling is not happening, and, and that's, that's just unacceptable, but we don't make it easy in terms of we've been asking for dumpsters to be put for cardboard at different locations because cardboard is the real issue. And you see that picture you have in this packet of cardboard being put in a garbage can, and that's not recycling, right? But when they don't have any more room, if they're not, you know, if they, if they run out of room, we're not making it easier to drop it off at a train station. You have those, so we have to sort it out. At Kane's Lane, if you have additional recyclables, it's not easy. You can't single stream it. You have to sort your glass, your greens, whatever you have to do, mix it. I mean, it, it, we have to also look at making it easier too. Well, we did actually purchase in the past in a couple of months brand new large um, recycling containers for the train station recycling center. So Are they there? Yet? They're not there yet. We just got them. We had to modify them so the residents could put them in their part. Single stream. No, they'll be uh, co-mingled, which is not exactly single stream. Single stream includes mixed paper and cardboard. We're going to separate out the mixed paper and cardboard because they have a higher value that is separate. So that, as a commodity, you want to accept them separately. <coughs> Everything else that's recyclable curbs that can go into the other container. So that should be set up once probably in the next month or so. And we did talk about possibly putting them in some other Maybe on the north side? On the north side, maybe. Somewhere, maybe. Uh, we're still talking about that. Anyone else have any questions for Tony or Ted? Okay. Are there public comments? Are there actually public comments? Okay. Uh, Committee woman, Snell. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor. Um, I'm assuming there's a few of you out there that are here about the crematorium that's been brought up. It's come to my attention recently that there's continuing litigation between um, Fairview Cemetery and the zoning board. In hearing that, I contacted the planning board 
attorney. I'm a class three member of the planning board. So I will be at all planning board meetings. As most of you are aware, the March 20th meeting was dealing with the crematorium. On the phone, I discussed with him the possibility of bringing up an injunction at the planning board meeting. Um, and there has been precedent set for it. Um, my feelings about this being it's active litigation in the courts right now, that it's inappropriate for the time to be spent at the planning board dealing with it. Um, I think it's a waste of time and resources. It will cost taxpayer money. And there's really nothing that can be done when it's in court. So what I plan to do at the planning board meeting on Wednesday is to bring this up and hopefully consider filing this action so that it is um, off the agenda for the time being until things are settled in court and we will deal with it at that time. Um, and that's about it, Mary. Is there something else you'd like me to expand upon? No, thank you. Uh, to meet me in Hyde. Uh, just a couple things, uh, a couple of events that we uh, great for the public to know about. Uh, Lancor Fire Committee Seven a Blood Drive, March 13th. Uh, everyone should uh, attend if we can. And Leonardo First Aid Seven a Fish Fry on the 15th of March. Uh, fundraiser for the First Aid. That's all I have. Thank you, Committee Man Heibel. Committee Man Senator Brigham. Thank you, Mayor. I'm going to hold my comments until the uh, public meeting. Thank you, sir. Deputy Mayor uh, Fewer. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Thank you, Committee Woman Snell, as our planning board representative for uh, bringing that to light and uh, bringing that to the, the committee. I, I, um, well, I cannot comment on, on any, and neither can any of us uh, comment on a potential or a pending site plan application. I do agree with you that um, there seems to be very little logic. In, in so much of having a zoning board decision that is being uh, appealed and has not yet been decided for uh, having a dual, um, a, a dual application that ultimately can render that decision moot. So thank you. I hope you're successful at the planning board um, getting them to do take that action. And um, I think that's the, the right decision for the board, I was the planning board members. So thank you for that. Um, a couple of comments tomorrow. The state well, just needed me to town hall here. Um, tomorrow, the I believe the governor is going to address his budget address in Trenton. Is that correct, Mayor? That's correct. Yes. Okay. Um, I make the same comments before the budget address. We have the liberty of having a meeting every Monday before that Tuesday in March, and uh, I will say the same thing. Um, Governor after governor continues to continue, irrespective of party, continue to push down trend spending policies on municipalities and our colleagues at the Board of Education. So these unfunded state mandates clearly will have an impact on our municipal budget, as I'm sure they'll have an impact on our Board of Education, our school budget. Um, state aid is a topic that I think is a a, or a, a subject that I think is a misnomer. In my opinion, state aid is our money that belongs within the municipality and continues to be cut for other spending priorities around the state. That's got to stop. If that continues, then we'll, we will continue to have pressure on our taxpayers. Budgets rise by 3, 4, 5 percent. Spending rises in trend constantly. And constantly, this governing body, which came in in two years in a row with a 0 percent tax increase, reigns in their spending. It's unsustainable the more they continue to push these mandates downstream. So I hope that the governor will find spending cuts tomorrow. I am not, well, I'm not optimistic based on what I've read, but I'm hopeful that there may be some. I am hopeful that they will not cut more money of our taxpayer money from the municipality and from the Board of Education that they've continued to do. I'm hopeful that they will keep it at least flat, despite the fact that we have been cut by several administrations, again, regardless of party. And I'm hopeful that at some point, the taxpayers are going to realize that this is unsustainable. 
I always every year talk about one little subject called energy receipts taxes. Some of you who are here in the audience today were probably part of the rage battle that we were actually able to speak about because it was a pending land use application. Um, and we fought, and we fought power lines, but the little known factor is there's money that's supposed to come to municipalities for those right of ways, and it's millions of dollars. Those millions of dollars have been taken away years ago. There would be significant tax cuts from this order had we had them just restored, not even the back money that we're owed. Six million a year, Colleen? Five and a half to six million a year. Just to put that in context, a half a million dollars is about 1%, maybe a little over half a million dollars. So that's a 2% for every million. That's about a 10 or 12% tax cut just to down here to come back. But know that money is being spent elsewhere. So again, I'm hopeful. I'm not optimistic. We'll do our budget at the end of the month, I believe. We're probably we're doing our meetings now. I know the board that is going to do theirs. And uh, we'll hope for the best. So thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Um, just uh, very quickly, obviously, I just want to thank uh, the President of the School Board, Pam Rogers, who is here tonight for joining us. Um, and I also want to just uh, two quick things. Uh, I want to thank Committee Woman Snell. I think your uh, comments about the procedure uh, and, the, and the resources uh, being used are, are valid points. Um, two quick uh, items uh, that I just want to bring up. Obviously, uh, we're not normally in this room, so we, we normally skip our Township Committee comments. Uh, but I will welcome Brennan's um, uh, deli to Route 35. Uh, now I want the, and I know our council here, Brian Nelson, doesn't have to drive to Robinson to go get Brennan's anymore. It's right up here on 35. Um, so I will welcome them to the neighborhood. And then secondly, uh, don't forget the Middletown Mobile Town Hall it is being two of them next week. Uh, one on March 12th. Uh, which is at the um, Lincroft BMS. Uh, Link fire. Link fire. I'm sorry, Lincroft Fire. And uh, March 14th is at the library um, in Newmont. And you do not have to live in those areas to go, but you have the opportunity. I know you said Middletown Library, not Newmont. Middletown, on Newmont Road. Oh, Newmont Road. Sorry. Uh, that's okay. Uh, but, um, uh, you don't have to obviously live in those districts, but there will be members of our different departments there to answer your questions. Um, and, and I welcome anyone to attend 6 to 8, 6 to 8, um, on, on March 12th and March 14th, and then we'll have two others the following week. So uh, with that, uh, I'm going to open up to um, public comments. Before I open it up, I would just like to, to say one or two things. One, please state your name and your address for the record. Um, I ask that you keep your comments to five minutes. At four minutes, I would let you know that you have one minute left, and if you could please start to wrap up your comments. I am actually going to ask uh, uh, Mr. Nelson to, because uh, obviously I know that there are some folks here with regards to the crematorium. I am going to ask him to just elaborate a little bit as to why the township committee, um, as we did at the last township committee meeting, why we are not able to make comments about a pending application, whether it be before the planning board or the library board. What committee woman Snell was, was referring to was with regard to procedure, not with regards to the application itself. Um, so I'm going to ask Mr. Nelson before I call anyone up here to um, please, uh, please just uh, go over why we can't. I know uh, many of you um, may not know exactly the reasons why. I just want to make sure you understand that it, it gets very complicated and, and you all have uh, very important things. I know this is a, a sensitive matter, so I would just ask him if he could just make that brief comment. Yeah, just beyond what Committee Woman Schnell has indicated, um, there is no, nothing, no items on the agenda uh, regarding this uh, matter concerning the Ferry Cemetery's application before the Planning Board, which will be uh, at its March 20th meeting. Um, it's not before the Township Committee for consideration. Um, there is still pending litigation, as the committee woman mentioned, regarding the prior zoning board application that was denied. Um, and asking questions or voicing concerns regarding this application before the Township Committee 
is not going to be helpful in um, raising those objections before the planning board, which is a separate uh, legal body from the township committee. Um, it could even be uh, counterproductive. Um, any comments or questions regarding this application are best directed before the planning board on March 20th, where testimony is taken, where cross-examination is permitted uh, of the applicants, professionals, and experts that they may present at that hearing. Um, and that's really the appropriate forum for those. So um, obviously this is a public comment session. You can comment on anything you would like, but um, the township committee is going to be restrained in what it can answer uh, and, and comment on regarding that application so that neither the applicant nor objectors to the application, application are uh, prejudiced uh, before the planning board's hearing. So, so uh, as Mr. Nelson mentioned, it's not that we don't want to make public comments, it, it is that we, you know, on the advice of council, cannot. So um, we appreciate all your comments. As I said, just your name, your address. Uh, you do have five minutes, and at the four minute mark, I will um, I, I will let you know, just so if you can wrap up your comments. And Morgan, just real quick, could you go down to the other room and just make sure if there's anybody down there that they know we're down here? Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. Before you do it, sir. Thank you. I'm Daniel Minori, M-I-N-O-I. I live at 377 Oak Hill Road. I contributed $4 million in taxes to this town over the past 25 years. And I provide an economic contribution of half of $5 million since I live here. In addition, I brought a company here with venture capitalist money $7 million will be back on days. So I contribute $12 million to this town. I'm an author of 60 technical books with Wiley, with Rob, you name it. I have been an agent professor at NYU for 16 years, practiced for two years, and Stevens Institute for 10 years. I'm an expert witness for technical matters with numerous depositions and court testimony. I have degrees from various universities. I'd like to briefly talk about statistics. Then I'm going to talk, mention the fact that some are concerned citizens. And then I'm going to talk about some quick medical research. So on this graph right here on page two, the statistics show that the presence of a crematorium keeps the home values down. Uh, in, in fact, I'm going to give you my personal copy to someone so you can see the raw comments that I have there. And we can see there that the locations such as uh, Trenton, Hendon, uh, uh, Patterson, they all have home values. They are fairly low. The average of those 25 locations that have crematorium, the average of home values is $207,000. The value of properties, the average value of properties in uh, Middletown is two, is four hundred and uh, twenty-six thousand dollars. So statistics, and we can talk for an hour, but I only have five minutes, says that if you have a crematorium, then your home value is by necessity lower. We can talk about correlations. The statistics is always correlated. The statistics are correlated that day, but the fact remains. The five or twenty-five towns in New Jersey out of the out of the five hundred and sixty-eight towns, those twenty-five towns that have crematoria have home values half of what would be middle town, and we don't want to join that club. Also, and as you can see on the next page, and unfortunately since I gave my personal notes out, I cannot quickly run down the key towns that I wanted to mention, but they are there like Patterson, this, that, and the other thing. Thank you. Okay, I'm using up my five minutes here. I just want to call attention to the following. The Patterson, the uh, Clifton, the Newark, the North Brunswick, the North Bergen, Trenton, uh, uh, Richmond, uh, Tom's River, Linden, Orange, uh, etc. So these are towns that had an in them. Now there are four there are 2,500 cemeteries in New Jersey. Apparently from the best available data, only 25 
cemeteries and crematorium. That's what's publicly available by the association. If there are more, let us know. So we are simply asking, why would we build town in suburbia, not in Serbia, not in rural? Why do we want to join those 25 other towns that I mentioned, my name, Kingdom, Trenton, and so on? They're towns. But why do we want to join that group and be enumerated among them? So those are statistics, so we talk about more. Now, the medium on the next page, according to zero, the medium home value in New Jersey is $325,000. Therefore, therefore, any town that has a crematoria is below the New Jersey, call it poverty level, let's call it that term. So you're below a certain level. Not only are below middle town, which is a very nice town, where we live here and our three kids went to school here, but we would be below the town at the state level. Now, that's the end of my quick statement about statistics. I'd like to move on to the next quick item of this concerned citizen. Do you need to be an expert? Some people have already challenged when we speak that we are not experts. All right, some of us are actually legal experts in our own field, but the question is as follows. Do you need to be a medical expert to know that if you drink a gallon of vodka in two hours, it's bad for you? Do we need to be an expert? Do we need to be a doctor to know that? Or, or we can express common sense? Do we need to be a, a chemist to know that if you inhale carbon monoxide for two hours, it's bad for you? Because somebody's already approached some of us saying that we're not experts, we don't have any green yeah. biology. Well, Fine. Yes, Do we need to be a medical expert to know if you take 24 animals in a day, that's bad for you? Do we need to be an expert over ecology and physics? If you drop off the eighth floor, you're going to die because of Newton's law and differential equations. So do we need to be experts in that? We just think we know that it's no good. So in the list that I have there, it's a brief summary of about 200 papers on this topic. The commission process generates particular matters, such as particularly mercury, dioxin, radiation, nanoparticles. People uh, that have pacemakers that have plutonium. People with prostate cancer, unfortunately, have medium. And people with other cancer are dying. Or oh, I'm dying. So now, in the last 30 seconds, do we need medical research published last night? That's immediately a, in opposition because the papers were published four years ago. First of all, the three papers that I'm citing here are all in the past two years. Then I'm going to make this final comment. Basic medical science does not change that fast. In medical results published in rectal journals, the peer review remain valid until an article from a rectal institution contradicts or invalidates previous results. We know for hundred years Sir, there are, are some bad. Please. We know the mercury is bad, we know the radiation is bad, same to Marie Curie. So we all know that we don't need a paper that was published yesterday to know the mercury is not good for our kids. They play in the park, the forest park, and the soccer park in the three schools, parks in the area. So these are just comments. We're not asking for your feedback. Thank you. Just like to register those concerns. Thank you for your time. It's appreciated. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, ma'am. Okay, see that. Middletown taxpayers being placed in an unfair uh, 
or, or having an unfair burden in place on them given the fact that they are right now paying to have the, the, the decision of the zoning board defended in Superior Court, Monmouth County Superior Court, while simultaneously being allowed to utilize or have our experts, our planner, uh, and our administration uh, and the time of our planning board uh, using those simultaneously. Um, I believe that, that was the point Committee Woman Snell was making, uh, and um, she, as she mentioned, the, the precedent that, had, that goes along with that, um, and, and that's why she's going to be making the, the, that argument uh, at the meeting. Um, I have one more question. Sure. So the question I have is, so this is now in the county courts where the plaintiff is the crematorium, yes. the defendant is the zoning board of Milton? Yes. Correct. Does this eventually have to go before the planning board too, right? Or is it zoning first? The planning? It, 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 they're done. Sorry. It's two totally separate processes. Okay. They made an application a number of years ago before the zoning board that required variances. Because it required certain variances, it had to go to the zoning board. Okay. The zoning board denied that application. They then sued the zoning board to challenge that denial. That decision is still pending before the superior court. While that decision is still pending, they made a different new application, which doesn't require variances. So that ends up before the planning board, which is a separate and distinct legal body from the zoning board. And, and that's, that's those two totally separate applications. One that's in court, and one that's before the planning board. So this, am I correct, because I read something recently that the, um, it's supposed to be 50 feet in from 35, is that the variance? That, that, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, we can't. The governing body is not going to have those okay, details because okay. application. Okay, so there's nothing I can go and read about this. So no public. Uh, you can get, you can get the zoning board's decisions. Yeah. yeah. Uh, they, they they would have a copy. Just check with the planning department. They will have a copy of the zoning board's decision and probably like a resolution deciding against the application. There'll be minutes from the meetings, so you you can look at all those things. So what's going to happen here on March 20th? That's planning. Well, that, that's, 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 planning. Planning. that's, that's a planning board. Yeah, that's not yeah, planning. Oh, the one thing that I failed to say is the um, I asked the township attorney for the planning board to draft a resolution and propose it to the planning board meeting this Wednesday, not on the twentieth. Oh, no. Yeah. 
Um, there, there's a, there are a lot of uses. Um, cemeteries in Middletown's ordinance, and you'll probably find it in 90% of the towns in New Jersey, list cemeteries as what are called conditional uses. Right. And they have, a, they have a sort of a special status within the law. Um, and a lot of those uses are the uses that you typically find in zones that you wouldn't normally expect them. Um, uh, things like places of worship, for example. So, and many of those uses have what, what we would call typical accessory uses. A crematorium is one, a mausoleum would be one for a cemetery, for example. In a church, it might be a preschool or um, a rectory or a residence for certain people. Um, and so, even if the ordinance didn't list cemetery, I mean, excuse me, the crematorium as a, as a potential use within a cemetery, um, state law says that's the only place they can be, then that would supersede it. And so they would have been able to make exactly the same application, so it really wouldn't have made a difference. So, um, <clears throat> my concerns in this topic are the court case for the current zoning board is due to be heard in May of 2018. And that's when the appellate court's schedule. It is now March of 2019. Does anyone know the timeline when it's going to go to court? And the second question related to that is, even if we do get a, 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 an injunction to stop the second application from being heard, that's just kicking the can down the block. So it's not going to change the outcome of one or both applications. That to me is still distressing because we're not solving the problem. The problem, as Dan said before, we can go into about economy and health and quality of life, and they're all highly germane. So my rhetorical question to town council is, what are you all going to do to protect our quality of life and middle town's economy such that we don't have to build this? Thank you all for your time. Thank you. So to Committee Woman uh, Snell point, uh, Snell's point with regard to waiting for the outcome of the, um, of the court, uh, it may provide some additional information um, at the, prior to the planning board hearing. And I think that's, that's the, that's the uh, request of the Committee Woman so that the planning board has better information prior to the application beginning. Any member of the, any other member of the public wishing to make a comment? Yes, ma'am. And 
And now I'm not going to want to live there. There's no way I'm living down the street from a freaking farm. I'm not going to be able to sell it for what it's worth. So, and I'm forced to be put in that position so that we can ship bodies in from outside of our community. It just makes no sense for Middletown. It is in direct vicinity of our wonderful neighborhood. Our, our neighborhood, Colston, is filled with young children, pregnant women, young families, older families, and it's in direct vicinity of Horsey Park Nature Preserve where our children go looking for frogs and on school trips to do research. It's also next to soccer fields where families and children come to play with play games. It's also in the area of three schools and many other residential uh, residential areas and neighborhoods all around. There's children, families everywhere. It's by Nutswam, Thompson, and South. And it's in the toxins and the research that we have to back up where these things spread for, and there's years and years of research. So for them to say the technology they developed in the past few years mitigates that those toxins, show me the years of research to back that up. It's so new, it's not even, we don't even have years of data to say that. So for the record, I want to state that this is a toxic and dangerous plan for Middletown. It provides no positive benefit to our town. It will harm our economy, health, and quality of life. And the research on these toxins and from these types of factories, and that's what it is, you're putting a factory next to our neighborhood, is well documented, and it will do irrevocable damage to Middletown. Um, and also, I just have to state for the record that the fact that Fairview is part of this community and pushing for this, it, I, I, in my opinion, is pretty sad. When we fought against other things, it was from outside powers. It was from people out of state. These are our neighbors and people from this community. We have over five thousand. We have five, over five thousand dollars signa five thousand signatures on a petition that we started within the past two weeks. Five thousand signatures, and we have over nine hundred Facebook followers already on the group started for this. That and literally, we, everybody is just finding out now. I want to thank the town committee for your time and for taking my statement. Thank you. First off, I just uh, thank you for your comment, ma'am. I, I just want to, for the record, just state the time that you found out about this, if you live within 200 feet or anybody found out, is the exact time that we found out as the committee. Okay, so just so for the record, so everybody is explicitly clear, and I can speak for myself, my colleagues, I'll speak for them, and they can uh, tell me if I'm wrong. Nobody from the cemetery came to us to tell us that they were doing this, okay? So I understand the process of not coming to meetings, not being, sorry, you've already said it, you, you can't. I just want to correct you. You can't, you can't. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and you can't correct me because nobody came and told me, and I will ask my committee members if they said anything different to them, that they were proposing this until it was filed with the planning board at which time the notice would be put out. So. August 14th it was filed. So August the 14th it was filed. Yes, sir. I can show you the document. Oh. Wow. So okay. We can't have go back and forth. It has to be as a part of the public record. So um, we can just respect everybody's uh, abilities. I'm going to call on the next person, but back and forth conversation, we're not going to have that. Sir. Yes, sir. No problem. My name is Helen Meditz. I live at 22 Ivanhoe Road. I moved to Middletown in 1970. At that time, there were 16 homes in the Colts Glen development. Now, there are over 125. Back then, we had numerous battles. We had the issue with cluster zoning. Some of you may not even remember that. I think you're all too young. That was in 1970. We fought that battle and we won. About 15 years ago, we had the issue with the power lines. Colts Glen fought that battle and we won that. Last year, we had the issue again with the power lines. We fought that battle and we won. 
I'm against the crematorium. Let me tell you why, very simply. I was there at 9-11 in New York. When I walked to Lower Manhattan, I was covered with dust. I got on the ferry, got off the Atlantic Islands. The fire department was there. They saw all the white dust on my body. They didn't know what it was. They hosed me down, suit and all. Everybody back then said, all oh, these so-called experts, there isn't a problem with the dust and the pollution. You remember the EPA, what they said. You remember what Whitman said, not a problem. Well, the problem occurred over the years when my friends started dying of cancer. And now we have the lawsuits. I hope Middletown isn't going to repeat the same problem. Think about that. Think about the young children that are being raised in Middletown. Think about that. You have an obligation, you have a duty to protect us. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Joke. 
this cannot be for real. Right. And um, one thing I'm, I'm hoping for is that um, I know I know my neighbors, and I know the fighters, and they're not going to give in to this situation. Um, and I, what I expect come the planning board meeting is that there will be thousands of people that will be here protesting this crazy scenario. And um, I just would hope that you as citizens and people who are in a position of power, that you will join us in this fight. Because this is not just about our, our neighborhood or my backyard. This is about our town. This is about our area. And this is about the future of our children. And uh, I just hope that you take all those things into consideration and, and join us in this fight. So thank you very much. Thank you. More than 20 years ago, I had the pleasure of meeting uh, Judith Stanley at a uh, fundraiser for Christy Whitman that my uh, law partner was hosting. And Judith Stanley was a uh, member of the chairperson of the planning board for many years. She was also a member of the Middletown Open Space Committee. And although I was not living in Middletown at the time, I understand she was instrumental in placing on the ballot the uh, the uh, open space question as to whether there would be an accident in the space. I think perhaps most dear to Mrs. Stanley's heart was the preservation of open space. Um, when I met Mrs. Stanley, I was contemplating running for office in my municipality. And I asked her for some advice. Um, and you got it. I did. <laughs> Guaranteed. Without hesitating, <laughs> Mrs. Stanley said to me that Although every decision one makes as an elected official is important, what is most important is what you do for the future generations of your residents in town. So while it will be important as to whether during one's tenure on the governing body, whether taxes are raised a penny or decrease a penny, those are important decisions. But what's most important is according to Mrs. Stanley, the preservation of open space. That will be a legacy by which the governing body will be remembered. None of us knows what the planning board will do during their application. None of us knows how the litigation will turn out. But we do know that this governing body has the power to exercise eminent domain over property to preserve it for open space. I'm sure Mr. Nelson is familiar with the case that was decided by the New Jersey Supreme Court entitled Mount Royal Township versus Mike Royal Homes, LLC. And in that case, there was a subdivision that was approved in Mount Royal. And before the subdivision could be built, the town exercised the power of eminent domain over that subdivision. And that property today is preserved forever as open space. I asked this governing body to begin the process of examining power of eminent domain over this property. That is the legacy that you want to be remembered for, not the governing body that allowed a crematorium to be built in town. Thanks very much. Any other member of the public wishing to speak? Yes, sir.
people come up here talking about, about this, about talking about having emotions about this. This is an issue that is a zoning issue. Spot zoning is illegal. If it's legal, it's legal. Let them build it and don't take taxpayer money and pay lawyers to fight something that you know is illegal. Just let it happen. The crematorium is good for the neighborhood because we're bringing money to that cemetery and maintain that cemetery. I'm a deed holder in that cemetery. My family's in that cemetery and I want to see it maintained properly. And this is a good thing, not only for the cemetery, but for people have to drive past there and look at it. Thank you, sir. Any other member of the public wishing to? Yes, ma'am. My name is Regina Macklewitz, 47 Foxwood Run, Middletown, New Jersey. I'm the founder of the Facebook group called Stop Fairview Crematorium. In April of 2017, I was sitting at my dinner table perusing Facebook, and I saw an announcement that said, hey, anybody going to the zoning board? So I went, and while I was sitting at that meeting, I created that Facebook group. The group has grown from 70 people to over 800 members. So if any of the board members want to find out about what's going on, what our research is, what our events are, any of the plans that we have, please join Facebook group Stop Fairview Crematorium. We also have a website, stopfairview.com. All right, thank you very much. So, Mr. Nelson, just so we're clear, I don't think we can do that because then we would potentially you can't condemn property. No, 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 no. I'm talking about joining you. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. 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 You, you, you uh, yeah, you um, could be problematic for the the uh, application for the opposition um, because it can raise conflict issues. But if the information is public, if you're not the public, yeah, I mean, if somebody went to it and read it, that, that's yeah, we're reading it. Yeah, yeah, we just you have don't have to be a member of the face of the, uh, the website okay, in order to use the information. Oh, yeah, you can that's read it. Yep, that's all I just wanted to clarify. Thank you. Any other member of the public wishing to speak? Yeah, Trisha. Good evening, Trisha McGuire, 49 Foxwood Run. Um, we did discuss process, and I wanted to share because there are quite a few new faces here. My experience with process um, when we're asked in this space, because we are not allowed to address specific issues to take those issues to the planning board. And my experience and observation has been that oftentimes the public are not able to express their concerns in that space because, as process dictates, it's a hearing and only the information on the agenda at that time is able to be uh, aired. So I understand that. So. I heard a comment this evening that emotions have no place here, but emotions are community. And so tonight I would just like to thank you for allowing the public to bring their emotions and their concerns here, because um, I'm not sure that those will be heard at the planning board. It has not been my experience, so thank you. Yeah, and Jim, if I can just make a quick comment. And, and uh, there's, there's no question that the public will, will be provided opportunity to speak at the planning board. Um, the reason I asked Mr. Nelson to speak to the process of, of why we can't speak was so because it is complicated. It is cumbersome for for every resident to understand the procedures and practices of of every board. Right? It, it, it takes us even time to, to learn that. Um, there are obviously times that there's uh, an appropriate venue. Uh, the, the appropriate venue and time uh, to speak and comment on this planning board, on this application uh, is the planning board meeting. How the chairman uh, decides to um, work that into the into the uh, into the equation into the hearing itself it, it is up to him with the, with the council of the of the uh, planning board's attorney. Uh, but the, there's no question that the members of the public will be granted an opportunity to speak and, and have not only their comments, but, but their emotions, um, it, you know, heard at that meeting. I do not remain optimistic that will be the experience of the public, but thank you. Just to add to that, I think I've said this 
that other means, but just as a you know, bit of advice, when going to the planning board with these things, just keep in mind that the planning board and the zoning board are basically like a panel of judges. And how do judges make their decision? Judges make their decisions based upon evidence and testimony, right? That's what has to happen at the planning board meeting. You have to have evidence and testimony, because the applicant's going to have it. So the only way to counter that is to have your own evidence and testimony. So it's true that emotional comments, emotional feelings are important, but they're not, the planning boards are not allowed by state law to base their decisions on those. They have to base it on testimony and evidence. So while I do know that if you take too much of a certain medicine, it'll make you sick, and I don't have to be a doctor to know that, that's not evidence, okay? You have to deal with the applications before the board and address the concerns you have and the, the worries that you have about, about it, but provide, provide evidence about it. You can't just say, I'm pretty sure it'll be bad for us. But, you know, you have to be able to provide evidence from somebody who is an expert, okay? You can't just say it. Uh, you have to have expert testimony to deal with planning board applications and zoning board applications. Any other member of the public? Seeing no member of the public, I move to close public portion and adjourn. Second. Yes, sir. Yes. 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 Yes.